Jin Dubri skeptics. E Jin Kia Bazo Zafrosenium ya do Wrocław. Jin Kia, Jin Kia. So, hands up if you've had an out of the body experience. One, only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Hands up properly, keep your hands up. Ah, oh, it's about 10, thank you. Out of how many have we got here? A hundred and something. Mm, I suspect there might be a few not admitting to such a strange phenomenon. Uh, I have, and this is why I'm here. And in a way, my talk today will be uh, the story of my life with a great resolution, a uh, kind of scientific resolution that makes me feel a lot better. Uh, it, might not, it might be better if it didn't make me feel better, um, but anyway, that's the story that I want to tell. So let me just take you back to 1970. Yes, that's the sort of hair I had then. <laughs> The picture on the left is how my mother would like me to look, only she'd rather I brushed my hair, of course. And the picture on the right is how I like to look. And uh, when I was a student, I got involved in the Psychical Research Society at Oxford, and we invited mediums and spiritualists and um, uh, crystal ball gazers and what have you um, to come along to the society. Um, and we messed around with Ouija boards a lot. And one night, in November 1970. I was, uh, after our Ouija board session, you know, hours of sitting there like this, I was really tired. I've been having a fantastic first term, you know, staying up till four in the morning and um, getting up for nine o'clock lectures and generally having a good time. And so I was really, really tired and I'd been going like this for hours and I went up to a friend's room to smoke a joint and I sat there listening to some music. Any guesses what the music was? Oh, very good, very good. I don't actually know what it was, but I think it would have either been Grateful Dead or Pink Freud. Pink Freud? <laughs> Ooh. I, I've never done that before. <laughs> Anyway, whatever it was, and I'm sorry, some of you, a lot of you probably know this story, but it's, it's so relevant that I want to uh, retell it briefly. Um, so I'm, I'm sitting there, cross-legged on the floor, uh, like in that picture, and uh, I start going down a tunnel. And it was a tunnel of trees. It was as though I was either on a horse or being kind of dragged along by a horse because there was this noise, dun 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 and there's leaves whizzing past and I'm going towards this bright light and, you know, and, and then my friend said to me, uh, do you want some coffee? And I <laughs> uh, did not compute. I couldn't answer. And she went off in a huff into the corridor to make coffee and my other friend, Kevin, was sat there and he said, uh, this is a really interesting question. He said, uh, Sue, where are you? <laughs> well, I couldn't say I'm in a tunnel, and, and you know, so I, I tried to think, and everything was blurry, and I realized that I was kind of floating and feeling unstable and a bit weird, and um, I tried to think, I'm in Vicky's room, I know I'm, I must be in Vicky's room, and I tried to kind of bring myself back, and instead of coming back to normal, I found myself on the ceiling looking down at the two bodies below. And I could see, well, I could see myself and Kevin, and I could see Vicky out in the corridor, I could see through walls, and I was about ceiling level. And I watched as the mouth said, I want the ceiling! And Kevin said, wow, it's astral projection! And I thought, wow, it's astral projection, this is amazing. Now, from what I know now, um, it would be most likely that I just went, was too scared and went straight back to normal. That's what happens to most people. So most OBEs last only a few seconds or a minute or two. But you see, I had Kevin there and he kept saying, oh, have you got a silver cord? What can you see now? Can you move? Can you get outside the room? And answering those questions all the time just kept me busy. And after all, I've described the kind of state I was in. So. Uh, I started off um, moving around, I went out of the building, I went through another room above, and I very carefully looked at all the chimneys and gutters and roofs and tiles so that I thought I could check the next day whether they were right. And then I thought, well, I can go anywhere. So I flew off, and I don't want to make this too long a boring story, but it lasted more than two hours, 
and I travelled all over the place. I began as a classic astral projection with a complete duplicate body like a grey ghost connected by a silver cord and uh, I then began to change, became different shapes, became great blobs and flat sheets and, it, and then became just a point, like a kind of point of awareness. And then um, I, I tried to come back twice and the first time I came back everything kind of seemed okay and I thought, all right, this is safe to go off again because it was kind of fun. And um, so I went off again. And the next time I came back, it was really a bit weird because everything didn't look right. I mean, by now I've been gone pretty weird stuff. And um, I tried to get back into my body. And I could see the body there, but it didn't have a head anymore. And so I thought, well, I'll go inside anyway. And I went in the neck. And I kind of got really small and I was going around inside the body thinking, but I've got to get to the right size. I've got to get to look out through the eyes. And I tried to talk myself back to normal tried to get bigger and I tried to get bigger and I got bigger and bigger and bigger and then I couldn't stop and I just got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until I just became uh, bigger than the earth and I kind of became one with the universe. <laughs> you may laugh, you may laugh, but I think it became a classic mystical experience in which the sense of self disappeared. There was no longer me and the universe, there was just stuff. And time and space ceased to have the same... There was kind of time and there was kind of space. I mean, there was some sense of there being a universe, only there wasn't me. And things were happening, kind of, but not really in normal time at all. And I thought, well, that's it. That, that's... that's I, didn't, I, I didn't know anything about mystical experiences or anything about meditation or anything of that kind. But I thought, wow, you know, but I didn't really, couldn't really think any more much. And then Kevin said, well, what next? <laughs> I'm like, well, there can't be anything next. Uh, what next? And I got this massive sense that there's always something more. And at that point, I was just utterly exhausted. And from then on, it took me about 20 minutes, half an hour, which seemed like ages, to get back to normal, persuading myself, you have to go inside the body and look out through the eyes. You have to, if you want to go anywhere, you've got to take the body with you. And that seemed such a terrible thing, because why would I, this, you know, this me, this important conscious me, have to take that great lump of stuff with it? Because every time I sort of thought anywhere, I'd go there and, you know, you've got to take the body with you. And then, thank goodness, I needed to go to the toilet. So I had to take the body with me, because there wouldn't be much point going without it. So finally, I got up, went to the loo, came back. I could see auras around people when I got back around the others and around myself. Um, that faded over the next couple of days. And two days later, I wrote up uh, an account of what happened so that I can at least have that and my diary that I wrote the next day um, to, uh, to check at least some of it. Oh, how I wish I'd brought my little tiny cassette tape recorder and recorded stuff, but you know, I didn't. Sorry, shame, eh? Anyway. Uh, Thomas Mettinger, a German philosopher, whom some of you probably know, says, um, for anyone who actually has that kind of experience, it's almost impossible not to become an ontological dualist. In other words, to completely believe that uh, mind and body are separate. And astral projection, of course, is just one version of that kind of ontological dualism. There really are two worlds, they are separate, uh, and minds control bodies and the whole works, and that's what happened. And some of you will know and some of you won't. The briefest version of this story is that I became an absolute believer in everything. Uh, clairvoyance, telepathy, precognition, psychokinesis, ghost, poltergeist, life after death, spirits, souls, astral bodies, you name it, I believed in it. I trained as a witch, I read tarot cards, I did uh, I Ching, and you know, I'll stop there, plenty. And then I finally managed to get to do a PhD in parapsychology and I did lots of experiments. And those experiments on almost all those topics I've mentioned, I did experiments on. And what did I find? Come on. Nothing. Correct. <laughs> well, well, sort of correct. Um, in the sense that I found absolutely no paranormal phenomena. But what I did find and continue to find is people having extraordinary experiences. And I could not forget the experience that I had had, nor could I understand it. 
But what I did conclude by the time I finished my PhD in the late 1970s was that parapsychology was not going to give me any answers at all. But nor could anything else. All we had around then, I mean, I really tried. I wrote my first book on out-of-body experiences in 1982, and uh, I did my best, and a couple of other people, John Palmer and um, there were very, very few people, tried to explain out-of-body experiences um, uh, in, a, in a more rationally based way, but we couldn't really do it at all well. And all we had is what I would call negative skepticism. And this is why I've called my talk um, Positive Skepticism, um, the New Science of Out-of-Body Experiences. Because, and this is why I say it's the story of my life, because now I think we can get away from the negative skepticism. And what I mean by that is the debunking, the just, just reject it because you know it's false. The OBEs are just imagination. Oh, they're only dreams. Oh, they're invented. Oh, they're fantasy. Well, I had that amazing experience and it didn't fit any of those. I wanted to understand it and I didn't understand it. A, a, a less terrible form, but still, I think, negative um, uh, skepticism is uh, in the Skeptics' Dictionary. I mean, it's quite funny, and they've got some terrific stuff in there, but, you know, people who claim to have experienced being out of their bodies when they may have been out of their minds. <laughs> um, well, I get the point, but it doesn't get us anywhere. And then think about what we're up against. We're up against, go online. Have any of you been online, looked up how to have an out-of-body experience? Uh, I, my favorite here is the blue powder. Ooh, I would love to have some of that blue powder and I could sprinkle it on you all and then you'd all have out-of-body experiences. But, you know, that's actually quite fun. And some of those sites you can learn to have an out-of-body experience. But I don't... Uh, uh, of course, the trouble is they mix it all up and say that you can have... You can go into the future and the past as well as the present and make all sorts of claims, which, um, I, as far as I know, are invalid. And there are all these books... Writing my book, I've just published a new book called Seeing Myself, The New Science of Out-of-Body Experiences, and I've read an awful lot of this stuff. Oh, oh, oh. that's the worst. That is absolutely the worst. Uh, a medical doctor who knows he's right because he's a medical doctor and he's been to heaven and he... And then there's uh, uh, Heaven is for Real, and there's The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven. And it's interesting. They all go to slightly different heavens. They're all Christians, these ones. And the gates are particularly interesting. Then none of them have pearly gates, but one of them has um, seven foot high gates with a book which is six foot high and has names written in it. Another one has St. Peter who, who smells and looks like, doesn't say smells, he says he looks like a fisherman with all sort of fit, bits of fish hanging off him and all stuff like that. And another one has um, just ordinary human sized gates, but there are lots of them and they have meeting centers where um, all the people, when you die, you go to one of the gates in the veil and all the people you loved are waiting for you on the other side because they have been to the information center and they know you're coming. <sighs> well, can we have a more constructive kind of skepticism? Yes, we can. At last we can. <sighs> and I shall tell you something about it. I'm already taken half my time and I better hurry up. So. Let's begin where we should always begin with trying to have a definition. It's funny that I say that because I work on consciousness most of the time and we can't define that. So we're a little bit better off when we're working on OBEs. I define an OBE as an experience in which one seems to perceive the world from a location outside the physical body. Why am I telling you this? The definition is extremely important. There are lots of other definitions similar to this, um, but the important point is, if you seem to be out of your body, you're having an out-of-body experience. It's an experience. This enables you to be open-minded about the big question, which of course is, did anything actually go out of the body? That is an open question for investigation. So if we stick to this experience, <clears throat> then we can answer a whole lot of uh, very straightforward questions. How common are they? Who has them? Are they actually a kind of dream? And so on. And those questions have been answered with varying degrees of detail. So the first one, can anyone have an OBE? Uh, apparently. 
uh, here's the evidence. But the incidence is something, I've put here 8 to 20%, it actually varies a lot more than that. My own surveys, and I did do a proper random, uh, randomly selected um, survey in Bristol, which came up with 14%. My other surveys of mine have been between about 8 and 20. If you take special groups, students are always higher than, um, than non-students, um, people who take various drugs are higher and so on. But it's a lot, which is why I expected to have rather more of you, but you know, it's fair enough to have 10 of you or so uh, uh, say that you have. Perhaps skeptics don't have so many. I wonder. I don't think we've tried that to find out. Um, generally speaking, there's no differences in the obvious um, demographic sort of variables, age, sex, education, religion, that kind of thing don't make any difference. Most of these experiences happen when people are relaxed. Most when they're lying down, but not all. Most when they're lying on their back. Um, which, of course, is when sleep paralysis happens and various other odd things. Um, and the same people tend to have a whole range of other experiences in the surveys. Lucid dreams, sleep paralysis, um, it correlates with paranormal belief, um, and various other things like that. An obvious question is, am I going mad? Is it actually mad people? Oh, I'm a psychologist, I'm not supposed to say mad. Um, is it a kind of mental illness? Uh, no. At least the simple answer is no. Uh, there's been various research. I did some myself in, in comparing schizophrenics and people in hospital for uh, breaking their leg and other such things like that. There's been studies in America showing that generally people who have OBs are very well adjusted and so on. But more recently, um, there's been a lot of research, not a lot, but a helpful amount of research showing that it does correlate with positive schizotypy. Now, schizotypy is a kind of measure of schizophrenic type um, experiences. Um, it includes classic um, hearing voices and stuff, but it also includes a lot of other stuff. And there have been factor analyses dividing schizotypy into positive and negative schizotypy. And positive schizotypy tends to be to do with creativity and weird experiences and so on. So not surprisingly, um, OBs um, uh, are found to correlate with that. Um, but it's interesting that it correlates with creativity as well. Then there's absorption. This is the capacity to become absolutely absorbed in a book or a film or whatever you're doing to the exclusion of everything else. I find this slightly odd because I am about the least absorption person in the world. I just can't cope with anything else going on around and I can't I was very impressed with myself for watching a whole film yesterday. It was so gripping. But normally, I can't go to the cinema. I can't, I can't, I just don't get involved, you know? Um, so it's rather odd. So I, I don't quite fit that, that one. But fantasy proneness, yeah. Somatoform dissociation, that's bodily dissociation experiences. Um, all of these things um, it correlate. As interestingly, and this is something very recently discovered, something called pattern glare. Oh, we, I get that big time. So I want you to have a look at this and tell me whether you have any unpleasant experiences while looking at this picture. Hands up if it's horrible. You, if you're not getting it, if you have to ask. Hands up if you find this really horrible to look at. Yeah, we've got about a dozen people there. Now, I'm not going to look at it because, to me, it starts to move, and then it moves more, and then it starts to throb, and then it oscillates, and then colors start coming, and patterns start coming. It's called pattern glare, and it can be measured very easily. The way you measure it is you have um, stripes at different um, spatial frequencies, and there are some that set people off. Um, so it actually depends how far away you are. So not all of you are at the right distance to, to get the effect. But you'll know if you're one of these people because you find reading difficult because the letters on the page jump about. I thought most of my life that, of course, when you read a black and white writing, the, the letters jump around and move. I thought that's just what it's like. But I discover for other people, they stay still. Strange. <laughs> anyway, no wonder I'm such a slow reader and find it so hard. Anyway. So those are the kind of basic questions that we know a lot about who has the experiences. Um, then the harder questions really concern, well, the big question, what's going on? Does anything leave the body? Is there an astral body? Is this proof of life after death and the capacity of consciousness beyond the brain? Well, 
I'm sure you've all heard about theories of consciousness beyond the brain and endless consciousness and extended consciousness and quantum consciousness and, mm -hmm, uh, and so on. And so we have to ask those questions. Now, I'm not going to give you a lecture on um, tests for OBEs, but I will say back in the 70s and early 80s, there were a lot of laboratory experiments. If you pick and choose, you can find a couple of examples that really do show people in out-of-body experiences seeming to go somewhere else and see something and get it right. But it really is uh, fishing for data, I mean fishing for examples. Um, overall, the data is uh, very unconvincing. I should say, I'm sure you've been wondering this all the time, what about the roofs and the gutters? Weren't you? Don't you want to know? Thank you. I'm so glad. So, so uh, the next morning, because I mean, I know where could I go out there the night? I was just, ugh. oh, and Kevin told me that if I slept, if I went to sleep, my astral body would leave and never come back and I'd die. So he kept me awake the whole night. <laughs> um, and not the way you think either. Um, and then the next morning, I went out to look, and I was really very, very disappointed because I had seen certain kind of tiles and very old-fashioned iron gutters and downpipes and twirly bits where they collect the water and all that kind of stuff, which you might expect in an Oxford college, and actually they were modern plastic gutters. And I, but then you see, if you read all the astral projection books, they will tell you that the astral, astral world is a, is a, is a not exact an inexact copy of the physical world. And so obviously I was on the astral plane and not actually seeing physically, which of course makes sense because, I mean, I didn't have actual physical eyes floating around, did I? So, you know, it all, you know that was fine. I coped with that. But later on, um, when I began to do experiments on this, when all my PhD experiments had failed to find any paranormal phenomena, I met a guy whose name escapes me. Um, he uh, wrote a regular magazine on OBEs, and uh, he came to visit me in my little cottage in Somerset, and um, he said, I want you to test, I can prove to you that I can come to your house. And I want you to put on your, in your kitchen somewhere, uh, we decided on a five-digit number, um, a, one of 20 small objects and one of 20 words. And so I prepared all these, and every Sunday night, I got random number tables, and I randomized them, and I chose you know, a random number and stuck it. In fact, this is a drawing by my son who illustrates some of my books. In fact, relative to the window, the, the, um, the targets were, on the other, were over here, so that you couldn't, he couldn't come on the bus all the way from wherever he came from and look in the window. Um, you know, some sort of control over this. And he told me that if I made his favorite pudding was um, apple crumble, and if I made him apple crumble, it would tempt him to come. And he can have uh, out-of-body experiences any time he likes. This is, I'm uh, telling you about this experiment, only this one, because so many people say, well, you can't get an OBE to happen in the lab, or if you do, it's not like a real OBE, um, but you can't you know, catch someone having a spontaneous OBE. But this experiment gets around that problem because it's a genuine experiment with at least some control, and he can have an out-of-body experience any time he likes, and whenever he has it, he'll come and see them. But unfortunately, he never did. Over the years, Anyone I met who had claimed to have regular OBEs, I asked them to do the test. I explained to them what was there and told them where my house was. And several of them uh, had experiences and said they came. Um, only one actually told me the numbers and the words and the um, object. And she correctly got cat, but none of the others. And I mean, one out of 20, given all the other things, it doesn't amount to anything um, amongst all of the rest. So that was my attempt. I think it was a reasonably good attempt, but uh, led nowhere. So you can imagine I'd pretty much given up uh, for a long time. One thing that did then happen was a bit of understanding of the tunnel. And I think we've just, you know, we understand the tunnel perfectly well now. Tunnel experiences are very, very common. Uh, how, hands up anyone who's had an experience of, uh, usually on the verges of sleep or with certain drugs, of seeming to go down a tunnel, or just tunnel pictures. Oh, quite a lot of you, that looks like about 25. That's a lot more than had OBEs. That's what I would expect. Um, 
So uh, you get these tunnels. Now this picture here is actually from Ron Siegel, who did experiments with LSD, and this was drawn by one of, the, one of his hallucinogen uh, experimental subjects. Um, I've also met them. I did quite a lot of study at one time. I did a, present, presented a TV pro program on alien abductions. And um, I met loads of people who'd been abducted, uh, said they'd been abducted, um, and including one who suffered from narcolepsy. And whenever he just fell asleep uncontrollably, he would um, be abducted. And occasionally he went down a tunnel. Um, do just think about the similarities. They are so similar. Um, now we know how the tunnel experience works. It's all to do with the structure of the visual cortex, in particular V1, the primary visual area at the back of the brain. The way that the visual system is organized is such that uh, if, you, if you get hyperactivity happening in any part of the brain, and this is a slight digression, I'm going to say, my explanation for near-death experiences, tunnels, lights, OBs, uh, life reviews, the whole works, is that is all of those phenomena can be explained in terms of hyperactivity or excessive random activity in different parts of the brain. Now, if you get that kind of hyperactivity, which you will with hallucinogens, which you will with on the verges of sleep and so on, um, then you get um, waves of excitation passing across the, the, the cells. And so what that's going to look like depends on the mapping between the retina and the world outside and the structure of the cortex. And that mapping is such that straight lines in cortex are mapped from circles in the outside world. So if you have this spreading activity, then it will look like uh, circles. Under many conditions, it will look like expanding circles. If it's going in a different direction, it will be spirals. And um, this is why these patterns are so common, um, you could say ubiquitous, in many cultures where you find tunnel patterns, spirals, checkerboards, uh, and uh, spider's web kind of patterns. They're painted all over pottery, fabrics, all over the place. They're just a common uh, product of our visual system. And there are artificial intelligent systems that produce them as well, and Google Deep Dreaming and so on produce them. Uh, there's also the question of why, the, why you seem to go towards the light, um, which I think, although I can't, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, this is just my hypothesis really, that um, if you imagine this hyperactivity beginning and getting stronger and stronger, then um, because more cells in the center of the visual field uh, 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 more cells are devoted to the center of the visual field, the fovea, than towards the periphery. Um, you'll get brighter in the middle. And as the excitation gets greater and greater, so the, the light in the middle will seem to get bigger. And you've got no other reference, visual reference, and so you seem to be going towards this light. Oh, God. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I shouldn't swear in such place. And I've just been to church. I do recommend you go in that amazing church, uh, go out there and you just op there. <laughs> After yesterday's exorcism film, I have to say I was slightly chilled, but it's beautiful all the same. Now, why am I saying the new science of out-of-body experiences? Because in 2002, everything changed. A neurosurgeon called Olaf Blanke was, um, ha was trying to help a very severe epileptic who had um, uncontrollable um, seizures that were making life impossible to the extent that it was worth doing a very dangerous operation which is to, is to use a, an array of subdural electrodes. The dura is the skin over the brain. This is not just under the skin of your head, it's right against the brain. And with these subdural electrodes he was able to stimulate them in such a way that he could detect, try to detect, and in fact did, the, um, the seizure focus and was able to remove it and, and she was much better afterwards. But in the process, he touched this particular spot on the right temporoparietal junction and she had an OBE. And then he stopped and started again and she had another one. And she had just sort of things that I've experienced myself um, and did before my own OBE, drifting, floating, you know, and also legs and arms getting longer and shorter, uh, body getting bigger and smaller. Ah, you see, I'm beginning to piece these things together. And everything starts falling into place. Now, we know quite a lot about this from other studies. For example, um, uh, people with brain damage, if they have the damage in various different places, they will experience um, autoscopy, which is when you see 
a, a copy of yourself over there. You're still in your own body, but there's another one, like a doppelganger, you know. Or a hyotoscopy, where you're kind of, you've no idea which you are, uh, but it's only if it's in the right temporoparietal junction that you get um, the OBE. Actually, some are in the left, but it's still the TPJ. Um, now, you could say, well, okay, we know that you can produce the experience this way, but you could say, so what? Why do I say that? Because I know from my long, long decades of research on near-death experiences and the like, that there will be people who will react as they did with the God spot. And they will say things like, do you remember the God spot? Yeah, there's a bit that's fire when Carmelite monks are, monks are, you know, in the scanner and Buddhists are, you know, whatever. And what did people say then? Well, lots of people said, ah, oh, that's fantastic. We're beginning to see the underlying neurological basis of deep meditation. Great, it's a natural phenomenon. Ah, oh, but the other people said, ah, oh, this is the gateway through which God communicates to us. Um, so you could have the same uh, argument here. Uh, oh, this shows that an OB is a perfectly natural phenomenon. Oh, no, it isn't. It's the where, where the astral body goes out into the astral plane. So how do we defeat such an argument? Well, no, no, I don't think any experiment's going to, to tell you that answer, because you could interpret it either way. I suppose there are, we could come back to that. But I think the answer is to ask, what is that bit of the brain doing? And the answer is, and this is Wikipedia, oh, I love Wikipedia. Um, I give it money all, um, every month because I feel I use it so much. I think it's fantastic and I want to support it. Long may it stay the way it is. And I love the talk this morning about the importance of it. Um, so uh, the temporal parietal function, what's it doing? It's pulling together all the stuff needed to construct a self. And anyone who's wondered about the self, you know, what is a self? If, it's not, if you don't believe in astral bodies and souls and spirits, then how come you feel that you are a little thing inside looking out through your eyes and, and having conscious experiences and all that stuff that you probably feel? You may not believe it, whatever that means, but you feel that way probably. The answer is we're beginning to understand which bits of the brain do this job. Now... There are actual experiments. I shouldn't have poo-pooed what you said, but they're not they're sort of directly about this. I'm going to have to go very fast because I've only got five minutes left. What? This one says I've only had 31, and I've got 35 altogether. <laughs> Sorry. I'll whiz through it very quickly. Rubber hand illusion, I can't explain to you. Uh, you stroke someone's uh, hand at the same time, uh, their invisible hand at the same time as a rubber hand, and if you keep doing it exactly synchronously, then they get to feel that the rubber hand is their own. So what's been done is a full body version of that in which you uh, have um, a headset um, uh, on, on the, the person's head showing the video from a camera two meters behind them. And then when you stroke their back, what's happening is they're seeing their own back in front of them being stroked. And the effect is rather like the rubber hand illusion. They begin to feel as though they are going towards that thing and um, that, that the body, that, that is them in front and they're just watching from where they actually are. There's a second method, which is really clever and very difficult to explain, and I usually in lectures get people up on the stage and, and explain it, but uh, show it, I can't do that. But in this case, what you do is you stroke the person's chest um, at the same, well, you've also got the camera behind with the uh, video headset on them, and you also show them in front of the camera like this. And then the opposite effect happens. They start to feel they've moved back uh, to, uh, to the position of the camera. Um, and these are quite powerful effects. And there's even a method for doing both at once, and then you can manipulate the two and compare the effects of them with a robotic thing. They lie on this, and a thing automatically strokes the back, and then a person comes and strokes the front, and you can play around with them like that. What's very interesting, and I'm nearly there, is um, that the more, in, in various experiments that have been done recently, the more people feel that they're out of the body in these experiments, the less they react when you threaten their body with a knife. And the body temperature drops just a little. They feel reduced pain. You know, stick the hand in a bucket of freezing water and stuff. They feel it less. And they're really and there's a reduced social anxiety. But what I find really interesting about this is think of all the kids, probably adults too, who have out-of-body experiences in response to sexual abuse or physical abuse 
or people in accidents and great pain have out-of-body experiences, the fact that this dissociation actually does reduce pain is a quite a, a, a helpful finding, I would say. So, it all comes down to the question about self. And these experiments have enabled us to think about different aspects of self. And we're now beginning to work out how different parts of the brain around the TPJ are responsible for some people were divided up this way, the sense of embodiment, the sense of first-person perspective, the sense of ownership, it's my body, and the sense of agency. All these are illusory. They are in the sense that we believe that we really have free will and stuff like that. But we now can see how the body, how the brain is, and body are actually constructing these things. And I'll end with uh, Thomas Metzinger, um, who says that OBE research is now helping us to unveil the fine-grained functional architecture underlying the conscious self-model of human beings. In other words, isn't this fantastic that after all this time, what was completely mysterious, now I can say that's what I mean by positive skepticism. The OBE has gone from something that was just considered part of parapsychology, and all that the skeptics were doing was going, nah, nah, it's a load of rubbish, to, ah, not only are we beginning to understand it, and I can understand for my own satisfaction why and what happened to, why I had that experience and what happened to me, but it's actually contributing to some of the biggest questions we have about self and consciousness. Drink beer, Bartholomew.